I never got Bravely Default challenge runs. They just kind of felt like don't use X job for just arbitrary reasons, so they never grabbed my interest in any way, hence why I never tried any. But then I came across a light novel, The Pocketbook of R. I did a video on this a little while back, so if you don't know the deal with that, go give it a watch. But for now, as a refresher, Pocketbook of R follows Ring a Bell after the events of Bravely Default 1, as he basically goes through the same plotline again, but this time on pacifist mode. Now, I couldn't do a true pacifist mode like in the story because I can't mod the game or anything, but there is an actually outlined team setup that our heroes use. So I got to thinking, could you actually beat Bravely Default using the team setup shown in Pocketbook of R? And that, my dear viewers, was exactly the kind of theme I needed to convince myself to do a challenge run. The next two months were a seesaw of emotions. One minute I'm smashing through a boss's HP bar, and the next I'm deciding on a side of fries with the mound of dirt I'm currently eating. <laughs> this challenge swung around wildly in terms of difficulty, and today, we're going over all of it. This is the Pocketbook of R Challenge Run. Do you remember your name? They call me Ringabout. It's a pleasure. There's a single target. Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> of course, we needed to lay out some ground rules. Firstly, the objective. Since the book only covers one world cycle and then concludes on a fight with Infinite Airy, I decided on this. My task was to complete the false ending as soon as humanly possible, which is chapter 5. I would also be required to beat every single asterisk holder except for two, De Rosso and Yuliana, just like in the books. The game would be on normal difficulty and we would have to do a new game plus. Why? Well, Ringabell starts off the book with a couple of bonuses. In particular, he still retains his Dark Knight powers, his airship, and the katana Masamune. So in order to make this work, we'll need to carry over jobs and items. In regards to all the other equipment, at first I was using whatever I felt like, but quickly decided that it made the run too easy, so I made myself only use equipment that could be obtained at that point in the game, and sold off everything else that I could. In regards to consumables, we're just gonna pretend that the airship has plenty in stock and that Ringabell would have carried some with him. Also because we're going to use a lot of them. Now, it might sound like there's no challenge yet, but this is where it comes in. Like I said earlier, Pocketbook of R names a very specific team setup that the party uses to succeed on their quest. Aside from all having Freelancer, the only jobs each party member were allowed to use after beating their respective bosses were Black Mage for Anyas, Knight for Tiz, Red Mage for Ringabel, and Ninja for Idea. These are the only jobs I can have these specific characters use for the entire run. I can't let Anyez use Red Mage or Tiz also have Ninja. They are set in stone with their specific owners. So now, upon realizing that Idea is going to spend over half of this challenge on Freelancer alone until we get Ninja, I'm beginning to see where this is going to get tricky. And with that, we were set. Earliest false ending possible on normal, must fight all asterisk holders except two, Ringabell gets Dark Knight and Masamune to start, and everyone only gets one additional specific job to use for the entire playthrough. As Ringabell would say, let's get sexy! That doesn't seem right. Now the prologue went pretty... okay. Could have been smoother. Like I said, I can't alter the events of the game to fit the light novel's plot one for one, so we'll just have Anya's and Tiz speed through the first bosses as per usual. Ah, there's our boy. So we set Ringabell up with his bonus class and weapon, and then immediately proceed to Centro Keep. And the first of my many mistakes. See, between Barris and Holly, they don't even have 600 HP on normal difficulty. So my cocky assumption was that Ominous would only have like 600 HP himself, or maybe a little more, and that Ringabout would just knock him over. 
big fucking mistake. Holy shit, he didn't die. And he put very to sleep. Ugh. Kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. While I had blown my load within the first two turns, this little serial arsonist was ready to keep swinging because he had three times the HP of the last two bosses combined. Ah, he's not even half! Luckily, by some miracle on high, he did not wipe my team instantly, and we somehow recovered the fight. We can completely recover from this. I get to completely go scot-free on acting like a complete jackass. Choose your fighter! And thus, we obtained the first new job of the run, and made Añez into more than a healing bot. Moving right along, we headed straight for Lontano Villa, and the site of our last boss for the prologue, Heinkel. And once again, in my eagerness, I went completely stupid brain and forgot the mechanics of this very simple boss fight. Oh, that's right! I forgot about that. Granted, with Anya's on Black Mage now, we were able to immediately knock over the extra enemies anyways, and then throw everything else into Smacky Defender Daddy. And it was also the last usable job we were going to be obtaining until the end of Chapter 2. It was around this point in the run where I decided to stick to equipment from the chapter I was currently on, minus Masamune. Turns out, having an endgame weapon in the early game meant ring bell was pumping out a lot of damage. Crazy, I know! We did a bit of level farming in the butthole-infested desert before making our way to the local Waffle House in search of Jackal and his trusty sidekick, Sigma Male. Now, as you've probably noticed so far, Healing in these fights has been a bit of a... a nightmare. The only source of ability-based recovery we have is Treat from the Freelancer, which works surprisingly okay for now. But otherwise, if we need a larger heal or god forbid a revive, we are stuck with items. Meaning we are stuck with a limited amount of chances for recovery should someone go down. Adding on to that, we aren't going to have access to any kind of wide healing until we get Red Mage, meaning I can only heal one person at a time with an action. Thankfully, for now, this isn't the worst problem, as we make Kint turn that bakery right back around a dip, leaving daggers in my throat Jerome out to dry. It's too bad this doesn't go the way it does in the book, where Ring a Bell, uh strips down naked and makes Jackal and Kint stop fighting them. Huh. Immediately after that, we reorganize some equipment and move straight on to Jeff Bezos and his money-making apprentice, Slugma Nuts. Don't worry, he's definitely a completely different person. Psych, just kidding. I'm not your friend. It's Sigma again, and he's still here to commit fraud and flex that glute. While these two did chunk me as always, this time I was able to slap back just as hard to make quick work of the fight. Oh no! <laughs> Tis, squish his nuts. Or idea. Taking a break from dismantling big corporations, we continue with the main story and enter the Temple of Wind. Once again, I completely forget where the hidden chest on the second floor is located, rubbing my face against the stone walls until I fall into the back rooms. I literally cannot remember. I, I, I did this exact thing the last time I played through this. But all of that was pointless because Anya's was still missing her prom dress, and we can't have the fanciest of dances until it is obtained. Literally every time I've gone back through this game, heading north to the pervert's house, we get lots of nice mithril upgrades, definitely not obtained through child labor, and meet the saggy yo-yo who tells us we need to go find the gayest piece of string on earth to make her fancy suit. Down into Vestment Cave we go, and on to another boss I keep forgetting about. Dragon from critically acclaimed animated picture How to Train Your Panda. With all this forgetting going on, I should probably see a doctor. For the most part, Dragon went fairly well and we get the rainbow yarn. Bringing it back to Yuliana, we make the prom dress, fly immediately back to Anchime, and prepare for the first crystal boss. Just like with Dragon, Orthros made the mistake of only bringing physical attacks to the fight. And no party wides as long as I kept juggling its heads. What the dog doing? Oh! Ring a bell? Ring a bell? Boss full braves? No, 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 no. With this knowledge in hand, we easily breeze through the boss and go on to awaken the first crystal. But before we move on to chapter two, we still have business to attend to. Traversing our way through the Amazon fulfillment warehouse, we find Tiki Toby. Wait a minute, is that how it's actually spelt? 
You're shitting me. No. I spent two years being a Janny for that community. How did I not learn about this? It looks like it was spelt by a nine-year-old. Probably because it was. Ugh. Anyways. We find Tiki Toby having a diplomatic moment with recurring fan favorite tax evasion as they openly discuss their wicked schemes out in the open. So we intervene, and this time we remember to deploy the toddler gate so Kint can't depart again. Even if that means we get no booty sighting. This fight started to push back against the steamroller thus far, but it also began to show some early highlights of the team as well. While Anya's had damage dispersion at this point to mitigate some incoming damage and prevent her from falling over like a charcoal toothpick, it also meant the rest of the team were taking more damage, which meant a higher need for recovery. At the least, she still had silence immunity against Sigma Male's sword magic, while the rest of the party just silently battered away at the enemy. Tiz's protect ally was starting to come in clutch, Ring Bell aided a lot in the physical damage department, especially with damage dispersion helping him proc his adversity buff, and Dia was still throwing potions around. We tried to do a kill two tech bros with one magical bullet type deal, but screwed up and just knocked them over like dominoes instead. After breezing through the funky forest, thanks to Dungeon Master, we headed for Florum. Upon finding out Olivia left the parental block on the water crystal, we start heading back to Yuliana's place to get an outfit for the beauty contest so Anya's can get a message out to her friend. Oh no, it's another boss I forgot about, and I'm completely unprepared for. Land Turtle proved to be a close call, and definitely over our current level, because we got two when we beat it. I also learned that See You in Hell can crit when Ringabell did exactly that, and dealt 1.5k damage to the boss, literally one-tenth of its total HP. Nope, that's not good. Oh, the see you now. Once again, though, we managed to clutch it out and win on our first try. We visit Sage, he gives us a skimpy garment, and then Anyez just decides to wear her prom dress again, so we head back to Florum for the contest. AKA, a complete waste of time and resources. Now, the reason we didn't do any general leveling for the last two dungeons is because we were about to hit the treasure chest of farming locations. Florum Gardens. For the uninitiated, this dungeon? Best goddamn farm in all of Luxendark. See here, we're looking for these little critters. Alaroons, or as I like to call them in packs, Almond's Joys. Not sponsored. These little dudes are always part of a nutritious breakfast, considering how cram-packed they are with EXP and JP. Like, it's considerably more than anything else in the game. Make sure to use this if you weren't aware. Now we can get some much more needed levels way more quickly. Now, if we narrowly escaped the Land Turtle's Wrath, there's no way we were prepared for the Crystal Boss of this region. So let's check out these funny blue notifications. Our teaming proved to be exceptionally easy, especially with Tiz. She does nothing to Tiz. The man is just built different. And by that I mean he's built out of potatoes. Nothing Artemia did could even scratch this starchy boy, and thus a meme began to form in the chat. And now, with access to Minus Strike, Ringabell could sit on next to no HP, spam it, and then get protected by Tiz from almost everything. And then we moved right on to Mephilia, who was even easier. Turns out, when you're high on your own farts, all you can do is bonk people with a stick or hallucinate a giant orange land scorpion smashing into a group of people like a runaway trolley. And then unfortunately, when your friends come to take you home, you freak out, knock over the wrong person, and he wipes your group chat off the face of the planet post-mortem. And after that, we had Einheria, who was even easier. Besides not noticing a spirit barrier she put up at one point, the fight was so pitifully easy. By this point, I had started to figure out the team build. We keep Ringabell low so he can minus strike and do optimal damage, and Tiz will protect him against most incoming damage to prevent death. If he does go down, he'll still get a burst of damage out before we get him back up next turn with Adia's hands bound to the inside of the consumables bag, and Anya's is just part of the Shadow Wizard money gang at this point. We love casting spells. Yeah. With three bosses tucked neatly beneath our boot, we progress the main story. 
went to the Twilight Ruins, Olivia dies, got completely hosed by the two Vicks, says nothing, leaves. But with all of this out of the way, after spending multiple hours wondering if this was even a challenge run rather than a speed run, we found our first turtle. And by God, was he an absolute bastard. I already had a feeling De Rosa was going to be a tough one, mostly because he just naturally is one of the harder asterisk bosses already. Actually doing the fight, it was a hundred times harder. The man can cast Thundara across the whole party for half of their HP, he can self-heal, he can prod us with a pointed Point stick, stick, he can set our party to only having one action per turn, disabling default in the process, or he can just take our actions from us and have our teammates hurt each other. Oh, and if you damage him, he just has a 1 in 4 chance of getting BP for free. So now, we have to deal with all of that with no healer. I can't heal party-wide, I can't dispel, I can't apply Protector Shell to weaker teammates to try and reduce his damage, and the only time I can do a massive chunk of damage to him without risking a team wipe is if I race for the finish. The first attempt came to a very unfortunate wipe when I procced his revenge passive, setting him up for a full-on wombo combo deluxe next turn, while he applied dread to the three quarters of my party, making it so they could not default against this next turn, while the last person had no HP left. In the end, beating De Rosa took a solid mix of strategy, patience, luck, and positive mental attitude to prevail, even more than usual. And God forbid you have to spend too long in the second half of his health bar, because that full brave is going to be nasty. With De Rosa down though, we get access to the most important job in the entire challenge, Red Mage. It ain't going to be able to compete with Anyez very much when it comes to casting spells, but it is a healer. A mediocre one, but a healer nonetheless. So the first thing we do after recovering from the fight, we head down to the shops for some Almond Joys non-spawn, because there's no way I'm not going to take advantage of the white magic I can use now. We also took damage dispersion off of Anya's as it was starting to put the rest of the party in more jeopardy than was warranted and swap in silence immunity for now. But if you thought we'd get a break for boss fights, oh boy howdy would you be wrong. We move immediately onto the next big hurdle of the challenge, the living water mommy. Rusalka proved to be just as hard as De Rosa. It can charm, which I always forget about. It has a party-wide attack that chunks and creates three more copies of itself. It can reduce a target's physical defense with Aqua Regia. But there is one very slight advantage. Rusalka only does physical damage. And with Adia now getting into freelancer abilities I've literally never used before like Endure, we can save on protect casts and have Ringabell do more healing and minus striking instead. And even though Ringabell should have been speed diffing these guys, even though they targeted him with six attacks in a row, they could not pierce the power of friendship, as Tiz absolutely tanked everything to protect this party's leader. With Rusalka dead, we awaken a second crystal, gain another ability slot, and finish up chapter two. Racing across the ocean, we blast through Grandship and head straight to Eisenberg's inland to begin taking down more bosses. I decided to try and take care of the automatons first just to get them out of the way, but instead they took care of me. Ah, no, cool. Back across the sea we go, level farm some more. The main purpose of this was to get Ringabell access to Blackbane so we could go really wide on the opening of the fight and then attempt to finish each robot off quickly after. But of course, Nothing goes as intended with these three freaks. Rocket Punch spam was quite a nuisance, so the fight kind of turned into Tiz and Ringabell, the only armored members of the team, doing all the work, with Tiz chatting out once again to save Ringabell when he could, and Ringabell just acting as a one-man necromancy team build before ending things with Minus Strike and a singular Thundara from Anya's. Yay. Yeah, it could have been way worse. Then, 
We did the performer side quest. God, I always forget how much this quest just straight up sucks. Globe trotting without the airship is so tedious. Got so bored that we came across a pirate and decided to steal his booty. Once again, Tiz just destroyed this boss to the point I was able to put the battle on auto. <laughs> Then we gunned it back to Eisenberg to finish Performer, and despite an extremely rocky start, we eventually got to a semi-auto position and ripped through Bunny Girl with ice cream. We then took a stand against Child Labor and proceeded to promote several of the slave drivers to the position of corpses, before heading to Stark Fort to take down another war criminal. But this did not go as intended. See, Kata always uses Water of Life on himself to gain regen, which gives him back 3% of his HP every turn, or 1200 HP. And because of how hard he hits with the rest of his abilities, I could not have Ring a Bell on both Healer and DPS now to actually do damage to him, alongside being unable to default. Without Dispel, this fight was currently an impossible task. So we decided to hold off on this fight until Ring a Bell learned Dispel at Red Mage level 10. So, for the time being, let's wander into a volcano. Maybe find a funny black rock with a creature inside it. Uh-oh. Chogmar was a lot rougher than I anticipated. When the boss can actually hurt Tiz, you know you're in for a doozy. I don't think I've seen this boss use Battle Thirst or Soul Suck this much before. It just took BP and MP away at the worst of times, which isn't really anything I can control. And the physical attacks were chunky. Hey, oh, he just died. But in all fairness, I'm mostly gonna attribute that to being underleveled. I had to use one of my precious mega elixirs in the process, but with some careful recovery done during the turns where Chogmar was raising or lowering its shield, as well as using Minus Strike to ignore said shields, we managed to get in position for the boss to remove those shields, only for Anya's and Ringabel to sprint for the finish line immediately after. Oh, come on. Yes! Oh! But with how hard the fight was, you know what time it is? Almond Joy, no spo. And we'll drop off Eggle and Caldus on the way, how's that? Returning to Eisenberg, the group decides to take a Kit Kat and break some kneecaps into Mogus. We poke a dead body and call it sus for about 10 minutes until the imposter reveals himself and we have what I like to call an emergency meeting. As in, you're a single target physical boss and I have a tiz, so prepare to meet the flat side of my shield, bitch. Oh, and we also know full cover now, which I will be abusing for the rest of this run. Thanks. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, that means... That's right, Idea doesn't have to sit in the fun time exclusion corner anymore. At least, not all of the time. Because now, we have obtained our fourth and final usable job of the run. Ninja. Back to Mora. And then, back to Grand Ship, because... Oh yes, there's another boss we have to deal with that I always forget exists. Behemoth. I don't think we were too underleveled for this, it was just that, mechanically speaking, this fight is fucking annoying. Toothy Rend was one-shotting members of my team through normal defense buffs, and Roar would just wipe everyone if I wasn't hard defaulting. And there was nothing stopping Behemoth from just using Roar back to back if it wanted to. Luckily though, against the single target physical damage, Tiz was able to keep Anya's and Ringabel nice and safe with full cover, while they would heal and deal very sufficiently. Idea also threw in some pot shots too, but didn't have a lot else she could do yet since she was only level 2 for ninja. With some luck and elbow grease though, we turned that monster into sushi. Now that we have a big chunky airship, we go back to Florum. And then it's straight up Starkfort's front door again with a level 10 red mage, which means we can dispel Kata's regen effects now. Even with that gone, he's still pretty harsh with his damage, and I overestimated how much damage I was putting out, so I nearly threw the whole fight, but we still cleared it in the end. And oh look, another single target physical boss! Unfortunately, Tiz couldn't protect against the counters, but Idea was able to Shipu Jinrai before Kami and Zumi could activate any Sword Master abilities, and Tiz was able to block his normal attacks. And then he knocked himself into negative 2 BP, and then we went 
full hog on him to close out the last third of his HP bar. Yeah, just this exact same way that he beat him in the book. It's more accurate. Moving into the last full chapter that we have to clear, we enter Eternian airspace. The duchy detects us on radar and sends out the troops, including the next big hurdle of the run since Chogmar. I was not expecting the Ice Golem to give us this much trouble, but here we are. This miserable bastard was all camped up outside of Eternia, and if I ever have to see this prick do one more ice-flavored Beyblade spin, I'm gonna have a fucking panic attack. Ice Golem loves role-playing as a merry-go-round, with all the nausea and vomiting and piz and shit one would expect to come with one. Look at him, just look into those cold, inanimate eyes and tell me there's more than two monkeys running whatever this thing considers to be a brain. You can't, because there are no monkeys. He just goes as he pleases, even if that means using Blizzard Blast like four turns in a row and severely damaging my mental. Even cost me another one of those Mega Elixirs, and we were still in Pokemon low HP blinking range when we won. Hell, poor Tiz had to sacrifice himself yet again for the clear, but it was a clear nonetheless. The fight wasn't a complete wash, though. Anya's got to Black Mage level 5, which meant Ga level spells. Ooh. We quickly healed back up in Eternia, got some new gear, and visited Idea's motherly mother, Mother Lee. Luckily, I was not required to do any of the Mountain Pass bosses and instead opted to just take the long route to Central Command, where we faced off against the next Rio bosses, Victor and Victoria. Here, I just employed the same strategy I used the last time against them, giving everyone a star pendant to neutralize two of Victoria's moves, Poison and Exterminate. This still meant I had to deal with Doom and the magic damage, which I was honestly a little concerned over since Tiz can't protect against magic. But luckily, the damage wasn't as bad as I was expecting it to be, so I just had to play around Doom counters until I sent Victoria back to the ball pit with Victor chasing after. With the job level up Tiz got after this fight, I decided to treat him to something cool. Two shield. Then it was time for some more grinding, but this time in Eternia, because here we have the Almond Joy's cousin. Coconut Isle, right off the bat. There are some nastier side enemies now, but the Mandragoras are worth it. Once we felt ready though, it was back into Attorney and Central Command we went. De Rosso put us in gay baby jail, Yoyana got us out, and then we zoomed to the top for another funny battle. You know why? Because he's single target physical! Brave was unbelievably easy. Not only was this because Tiz was way too much of a chad at this point, but also because we started using a new ability I haven't really tried out before. Kairai from the Ninja. This ability designates the target of all enemy actions for that turn, so we chose Tiz. Ah! <laughs> Light charm! This combo should be illegal. He did hurt Tiz until I started using Ironclad every turn, but it would have been considerably more to my other allies, so we'll take it. Oh! Oh, Tiz still takes it! Tiz still takes it! <laughs> In fact, we got Brave down so bad, we managed to set him to auto for most of the fight, only turning it off to gas Anya's backup occasionally. There we go. But the happy times would not last long. For the next boss, proved to be the biggest mental strain of all. Welcome to the hardest boss of the entire challenge, Gigas Lich. This boss was by far the most unforgiving fight of all, even compared to what came after. For one, I learned something new during the process. A little shatter animation on Slam? Yeah, didn't know that meant it pierced default. I just thought that was part of Qigong Waves animation. Fake fan, I know, I know. So anyways, now we're dealing with a party-wide physical that pierces default, a single target or party-wide magic attack, self-healing, instant death effects, and gaining 10% physical and magic attack every turn. We're fucked. This fight took nearly two hours from the first attempt to completion, although granted we attempted Phoenix down spam for a while because we were getting that desperate. There was no immune or guard icon saying we couldn't, but the chance was so ridiculously low, we gave up after a while and just went back at it. 
Ringabout really had to work overtime on this fight. He had to keep the party healthy, dispel the damage buffs from Gigas Lich often enough, and provide protect for Anya's when he could, since she's the only one that's really doing considerable damage in this fight. And we had to hand out some safety rings to avoid having people get wrecked by the instant death, which meant losing out on more defense, healing, or damage capability. Which really sucked, because this POS really loves spamming slam! I tried using Adia's Kairoi with some vain hope that it would help at all, but in the end, it proved futile. This was another fight that required the almighty Mega Elixir to make it through, but with enough perseverance and luck, we slipped out from between the fingers of death and took the win. All four crystals now awakened, we rest up, stock up, and make haste for the Holy Pillar to fight the final asterisk holder of the run. Alternus proved to be a very interesting encounter compared to anything else so far. In a weird way, he kind of encapsulated the entire challenge run, with some parts of his fights proving to be incredibly scary, and then at other times he was just getting completely cheesed on. His black mains proved quite troublesome and chunked the party pretty hard, but his minus strikes were, more or less, under control. Making use of Kairai once again, we had developed a great combo for Idea that feels like the true way of playing Ninja. By activating Usemi and then following it on the next turn with Kairai, targeting herself, Alternus's minus strikes would be completely dodged by Idea, only to be followed by a counterattack. Granted, it still took two turns to set up without haste and world or another BP source, but it felt good to use. It wasn't the cleanest fight, but it went fairly swimmingly compared to the last one. He does a single target. Yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> oh, and for the crit. There we go. With Alternus taking a trip to the beach, we were down to the last two bosses of the run. But first, to complete the Candy Farming Trilogy, we went back to Florham for some more levels from some Raphalesias. Or as we refer to them, Reese's Cups, Reese's Cups. Beat em up, beat em up, beat em up, beat em up. We also did some funny group cast kill shenanigans. Now, we have to fight one of the crystal bosses in order to enter the fall sending, so I decided to go with the simplest one, Orthros of course. Now, upon going into this fight, I made the mistake of having Red Mage equipped twice on Ring of Bell, so I tried to wipe real quick and restart. But then something happened. Tiz wasn't taking damage from the boss, meaning it would take over a thousand turns for him to fall over. And so... By swapping out one of his shields for a rune blade, we got to experience the greatest moment of the entire run. Tis crushes nuts. Oh my god, there's actually damage. We can do it! Yes! It's real!
and then we mash X, and then we die. And now it's time for the finale. We happen to get some useful gear right before the end, as well as a couple of mega elixirs to add to our current pool of, uh, zero. Anya has managed to get Pierce magic defense right before this, meaning her spells were going to be doing actual damage to Aerie in the upcoming fight. We also tried to set up a deal with Poison and see if we could lock out the first phase with Poison Punisher spam and avoid it with Usemi, but this did not work out. To be honest, I was a bit worried. First phase of Aerie, I wasn't the most concerned about. A lot of her abilities were going to be physical, even if they hit really hard, so I was hoping Tiz would come in handy there. But second phase is all magic, so I was very worried that we were going to experience a lot of wipes. But despite the concerns, despite all the ways this fight could have gone to utter shit, this proved to be the best fight in the entire challenge. When I say perfect final boss difficulty, I mean it. This wasn't bullshit hard like Gigas Lich, and there wasn't any particular part where I could loop and take a break. Every second of the battle was a test, keeping me on my toes and constantly having to readjust and reevaluate my approach. Elixirs were chugged, Faragas were traded with slaughter and flare, Idea endured and struck, Anyas represented her black mage ancestors by setting everything ablaze, Tiz got angry. Oh! And Ringabell was swapping between damage, healing, dispelling elemental weaknesses, and using absorb magic to take no damage and regain MP. There was just one moment of concern. There was one moment that nearly threw the entire attempt. You see those daggers Idea has on? Those are assassin daggers. they have a percent chance to insta-kill on hit. We came so close to wiping, but once again, Mega Elixir saved the day. So suffice to say, the instant we got her uncharmed, she had those revoked. It's not like she was doing much damage anyway. But there was no time to linger. We were so close to the end, and now we finish this story. That's it. The challenge run was over. For my first ever challenge run of Bravely Default, I have to say it was quite the experience. Would I ever do this particular run again? Mm, no. It was certainly a volatile challenge. That was the word that kept coming to mind over and over again once all was said and done. Volatile. Some bosses were turned into wallpaper paste, and others made me want to tear my hair out. Oh my fucking god, stop it! If you plan to do the run yourself, please let me know in the comments below. What kind of antidepressants are you on? Oh, and I suppose, tell me how the run is going or went. Now, what can we learn from this run? Well, Dark Knight is king as ever, always dishing out insanely good damage and getting an endgame weapon at the very start that increases crit chance makes for some really good early damage, which makes up for the lack of good healing. And Red Mage was... okay. It did the job it needed to, just not extremely well. Granted, MP3 in a pinch worked really nicely for a low health healer who likes tossing out minus strikes on occasion, so it was an interesting combo. Knight was a surprising MVP throughout the run. I've really come to appreciate the class a lot more now, with Ironclad, Full Cover, Supercharge, and Vengeance all being incredibly awesome. The picture-perfect Protect Ally procs, the endless 1 damage values, 
The fact that Tiz was able to solo an entire boss should say everything that needs to be said. Black Mage basically performed as expected. It's Black Mage, it does magic damage, and it does it pretty darn well. Nothing particularly amazing about it, but the group cast kill during our last grinding session was pretty funny. Freelancer also had a few abilities that were useful, like Endure and Treat, but it didn't really impress. What did impress me was Ninja. I figured that I was just going to be spamming Usemi and Shipu Jinrai the whole time, but with Kairai, I actually felt like I was using the job for once, so it was nice. Just wanted to say thanks to everyone who came on out to the streams and supported me. You guys are what kept me going at some point, so thank you so much for being there. And uh, make sure you like and subscribe if you haven't already, or else he will know. Ah!